Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Alliance for Aging Research's podcast, This is Growing Old. I'm your host, Sue Peshin, and I serve as President and CEO of the Alliance for Aging Research. Before we get started on today's topic, I wanted to share that we have now been doing this podcast for over a year. It's been incredibly inspiring to talk with so many people who are making a difference in the lives of older adults. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed listening to our conversations. And I also really want to give a shout out to Janelle Germanos. She's our communications manager at the Alliance for Aging Research. She generated this idea, got it started, produces it, uh, makes everything smooth, and just wanted to thank her so much for starting this. The guests on the podcast come from all walks of life, but they have one thing in common. We're all getting older together, and we want it to be a a better experience for everyone. Our guests are true change makers, and today's guest is no exception to that. I'm here with Dr. Ken Thorpe, the Robert W. Woodruff Professor and Chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management in the Rollins School of Public Health of Emory University. Uh, Dr. Thorpe is also the chair of the Partnership to Fight Chronic Disease, an organization that does incredible work to raise awareness of the impact of chronic disease on death, disability, and rising healthcare costs. And the Alliance for Aging Research is um, honored to be a member of PFC- PFCD. Ken, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Sure. Um, So you are the chairman of the Partnership to Fight Chronic Disease, as I just mentioned, also known as PFCD for short. Can you please tell our listeners a little bit more about the mission of PFCD? Well, sure. We have been around for over a decade now. Um, So we're a coalition of uh, organizations that that include uh, uh, patient advocacy groups, uh, health plans, um, uh, different types of healthcare providers, business groups, labor groups. Uh, And we've all come together in a really nonpartisan basis to highlight the critical role that uh, the rising prevalence of chronic disease plays in not only being the main driver of rising healthcare costs, but also the single uh, largest source of morbidity and mortality in this country. Uh, So uh, we spend a lot of time uh, uh, bringing data and facts uh, t- to bear to policymakers. Uh, we work at the state, national, and international level. Um, we have focused on interventions that do a better job of preventing the growth in chronic disease, uh, finding ways to earlier detect chronic illness, and then looking at different types of models of care that do a better job of engaging uh, and working with patients that have multiple chronic conditions to keep them healthy. Uh, So we uh, collaborate frequently across the aisles. Um, uh, We've, I think, had a lot of success in in putting forth uh, legislation uh, that really accomplishes and and deals with all three of those issues. You certainly have. It's, It's really, to me, it's one of the most effective coalitions that we're proud to be a part of. So thank you for our, your leadership and all the work you've been doing. Well, thanks, and thanks for your contribution to it. Absolutely. Um, so, so PFCD recently released a white paper that caught our eye. We were very excited about it with uh, D- uh, Douglas Holtz Eakin, um, Dr. Douglas Holtz Eakin, who's president of the American Action Forum, and he's also a former director of the Congressional Budget Office. And this white paper focused on the FDA's accelerated approval pathway. And I want to get into what the paper looked at, but first. Would you explain what the accelerated approval pathway is? Well, sure. The uh, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, instituted this accelerated approval program back in 1992 uh, to allow for faster and earlier approval of drugs that treat serious conditions that fill an unmet medical need uh, based on uh, different types of what are called surrogate endpoints. It really came to be uh, in, in the time of uh, HIV AIDS, uh, where there really weren't effective treatments available. Um, and as the surrogate endpoint, they used the, uh, your immune cell response to different types of drugs. So it was a way to rapidly expand uh, the access and availability to medications, uh, in, in this case, HIV AIDS, uh, to treat conditions where there really were no treatments on the market. So it's been a very valuable 
tool for uh, very serious and rare healthcare conditions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so tell us about the paper that you co-authored. What recommendations did, uh, I know the Medicaid and CHIP Payment and Access Commission recently uh, voted on some recommendations and I want to hear about the implications for patients and how your paper tried to sort of address some of the concerns that were behind that vote. Well, yeah, so we started to, to look into this because we were hearing from a couple of states uh, that they had concerns over some of these uh, medications and treatments that they were uh, essentially breaking the bank, uh, that they were a major part of uh, the growth in Medicaid spending. Um, so we took a look at uh, look at this uh, in terms of the last 15 years or so of how much of the growth in Medicaid spending was really linked to expenditures on these accelerated approval medications and drugs. Uh, and, and what we found was that uh, really they only account for about one to one and a half percent of the growth in Medicaid spending. I mean, it it's really has nothing to do with what's driving the underlying growth in Medicaid spending or, or really what accounts for, you know, the high level of, of spending on the Med Medicaid program. I mean, that, that those high levels of expenditures are really linked to patients that are really seriously ill. We call them dual eligibles that are Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid patients uh, that have all kinds of different types of disabilities um, that have uh, very, very high healthcare costs. Uh, so uh, we wanted to engage a discussion to say, well, if we're serious about slowing the growth of Medicaid spending, let's really look at what's driving uh, the growth in the first place. And it really has nothing to do with accelerated approval drugs. Uh, if we're really going to deal with uh, the high cost of Medicaid, we might, might want to look at what can we do to do a better job of working with these very sick, chronically ill, dual eligible patients uh, that have a very complicated financing uh, scheme that includes both Medicare and Medicaid. So how can we do a better job of streamlining mm -hmm. those payments, integrating the programs, doing care coordination uh, across both programs, uh, and that really is the direction that, that we're focusing on, is, is highlighting where the drivers are and where, where the real opportunities are. And there's a lot of opportunities there and, and rethink the, uh, the delivery model for dual eligibles in the Medicare and Medicaid program. Mm -hmm. So what, tell us a little bit about what this uh, Medicaid commission recently voted on around the accelerated approval program drugs and, you know, maybe why they did it and what you think some of the well, implications. Well, yeah, so, so they were voting on uh, the ability to give states the flexibility and in, in not including some of these medications as part of their formularies. Um, so, you know, that that's a real problem uh, because it, by the definition of the program, these types of medications are really filling a completely unmet need. And so, in essence, by giving uh, states the opportunity to not cover them, uh, you're really taking away maybe the only treatment option uh, for some types of patients in terms of managing their condition. So, again, we just, um, it's a, it was, an, to me, an unfortunate vote. It really misses the boat in terms of uh, really trying to focus on uh, slowing the growth in Medicaid spending, because this, this is not a program that has anything to do with that. Uh, and, and we're continuing our efforts to really focus attention on uh, what, what opportunities do we have to work with states uh, to slow the growth in Medicaid spending, make it more efficient and more effective. Uh, but unfortunately, sort of taking treatment options away from patients that have no other options uh, is really not one of those. Right, right. Do you think that Congress is going to act on this recommendation? And do you think it'll gain momentum in the Medicare program as well? Well, sure. we certainly hope not. Um, you know, I, I think as part of what we do, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about how can we make these uh, federal programs more effective and more efficient uh, rather than cutting out treatments. Uh, so rationing access to 
essential medications is, to me, is really not a viable policy option. And we're hoping that Congress uh, certainly does not uh, uh, take those recommendations from the commission. Um, instead, what we, you know, we've been looking mm -hmm. at uh, finding opportunities to continue to migrate away from fee-for-service payments, building models that better integrate care between hospital post-acute and home care and telehealth care, uh, to really focus on the whole person care uh, rather than sort of these different silos that we've been focusing on uh, in, in the past. And so there are good models out there that we can spend time on that will make both Medicare and Medicaid more efficient and more effective and produce better, better outcomes. Yeah. So I, I'm going to add this question. I didn't, we didn't send it to you in the script, but I'm just sort of curious about your point of view. So, you know, in recent um, legislation, there was a, a vast expansion of the uh, Medicaid waiver program um, for states to be able to use it more for home and community-based services. Um, and what what do you think about that? Is that something that you're supportive of? What do you want to see come well, out again, of that? There, there are some good models that we've seen, uh, so, sort of the uh, independence at, at home types of models that came out of... Um, out of Baltimore uh, some years ago. Uh, and those are models that seem to be very effective. So by moving patients out of an institutional setting uh, and providing sort of uh, evidence-based care for them at home, oftentimes using uh, remote patient monitoring, uh, using uh, telehealth, I think those are innovative delivery models that you know we need to take a closer look at. Um, They'll save money, and, and certainly from, a, from an individual patient standpoint, you know, getting treated at home is certainly going to be a more uh, pleasurable experience than, than being treated in a hospital or in other types of an institutional setting. Right, right. And also to your point, I mean, it's, it's not a new idea, but the work that you're doing to try to raise awareness of, of better coordination between the Medicare and Medicaid programs is really critical. I mean, it's been recommended by uh, the Medicare Advisors, uh, Advisory Commission for years. And for some reason, that nut has not been cracked yet. What do you think it's going to take to, to well, solve again, that I think we issue? need to have uh, sort of more, more focus, perhaps from the uh, CMS, uh, to continue to identify you know, evidence-based models that work. I mean, the challenge you have in the dual eligible population is that oftentimes you'll have a, uh, a Medicare plan uh, working with the patient, a Medicaid plan working with the patient, perhaps even a separate prescription drug uh, benefit. Uh, and that's not good collaborative care. So what we need to do is come up with models that really integrate uh, those, those three functions in, in, under one roof, uh, under one umbrella uh, to provide sort of integrated coordinated care uh, across these two programs. So I, I think that there are some models uh, that, we've, that we've worked on uh, using health teams, uh, increasing use of uh, some telehealth opportunities. Uh, there's just incredible innovations going on now in remote patient monitoring uh, that we can really keep track of, of, of these patients in terms of their vitals uh, to prevent, prevent them from getting uh, to the point where they end up in an emergency room or hospital. So I think the focus is on uh, delivery system innovations, and, and this is a great population to, to, to really spend time on. That's great. Um, terrific. Well, are there other PFCD initiatives that our listeners should know well, about? Well, we have sort of a related uh, group, the, the Partnership to Fight Infectious Disease, uh, that uh, we've, we've just started as well. And, and this is a, um, a coalition that's really focusing on trying to develop innovation uh, and developing new drugs to deal with antibiotic resistant infections. And so I think we've seen some good models of how we can spur innovation in that market. Um, it's, those infections have doubled over the last decade. Uh, uh, if we don't do something about them, it really uh, compromises our ability to do just basic surgery and surgical procedures if we're going to have sort of a continued rise in the, those types of infections. Uh, and so we've been working on promoting legislation uh, that would provide a, a model to uh, 
basically pre-fund the research to, to provide incentives for the drug companies to come in and innovate. Um, the problem is, 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 as big as it is, it's still relatively small. Uh, and the, the return on investment is, is quite low. So I think the model that we've seen uh, here with the uh, COVID-19 uh, approach, where the uh, government came out and basically made a commitment to purchase hundreds of millions of doses, uh, had a streamlining in the clinical trial process, um, it is a potentially good model. So we've been working on uh, an act in the uh, Senate called the Pasteur Act, which kind of does that. It, it does a subscription-based model and provides upfront front funding. So we, we continue to focus on innovations and in treatment uh, around uh, not only chronic disease, but innovations in uh, improving patients' health. And this is a, a new area that we just recently engaged in. Yes, and f thank you. Fabulous that you're doing that. We've been involved in those issues for a long time because it's critical for older people. They're the most likely to have antibiotic-resistant infections. So um, really grateful to you that you're doing that work and the work on the Pasteur Act. So thank you. Um, so here's a question we ask all of our guests. Uh, when you were a kid, what did you imagine growing older would be like? Well, that's a tough one. Um... So, I mean, because the models I had, obviously, were my parents and grandparents. And so I sort of envisioned, uh, envisioned that. And fortunately for me, um, when I was smaller, my, my parents and my grandparents were very, very active. Um, they were in relatively good health. Uh, they looked a little different than me. Uh, but other than that, I, I sort of envisioned... Uh, sort of just an, an older looking Ken, but somebody who's just very active, uh, very intellectually curious, uh, still loves to travel. And so unfortunately for me, I had some really good role models in terms of uh, parents and grandparents uh, about uh, the aging process. That's awesome. Well, so what do you enjoy most about growing older now? Well, I mean, it's, it's just, it brings on different types of, of challenges and opportunities. Um, so I think some of it is just developing a better uh, uh, reflection on uh, society, better reflection on um, individuals, um, a little bit more wisdom, perhaps, uh, a little bit more patience uh, in terms of uh, uh, how I deal with things. Um, but... Um, you know, for me at this point, the, the opportunities in terms of uh, uh, what I want to work on and what I want to do really haven't slowed down. So I, ha I haven't hit an inflection point yet in terms of, of uh, uh, things I'm working on um, and things that I'm doing. But certainly it, it provides a, an opportunity to kind of uh, look back and uh, reflect on, on the past and really understand the importance of the relationships I've had and family and so on. That's great. It seems like connection is a big theme, uh, you know, for you and the, and staying active, certainly. Um, well, Ken, thank you so much for joining us well, today. Well, thanks for I having really me on. I really, really enjoyed it. And it's, it's always fun to, uh, to see you and, and, and work with the Alliance. Uh, you too. Thanks everyone for listening to This Is Growing Old. Our intro and outro music is City Sunshine by Kevin McLeod. Please stay tuned for new episodes every other Wednesday. Uh, as always, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Please rate and review us if you're enjoying the show. Thank you so much for listening to This Is Growing Old and have a great day.